Turk is at the forefront of research up here at Lake Tahoe. Everything from the cutting edge technology to the long-term data set, we view this lake as the smartest lake in the world. We have some of the best trained staff and limnologists working up here. So between those tools and our staff and the training that they've received and the institutional knowledge that we have within our group, we really can do some top-notch work here at the lake. A typical day for the field team is an early start to the day, loading all the tanks up, throwing them in the truck, getting down to the marina, loading the boats, and then finally getting out on the water and going and doing whatever research and projects we need to get done. We're the only organization that has two research vessels on the lake year-round to rapidly assess what's going on in the lake and continue our long-term monitoring that we've been doing on the lake for decades. So this is TB4. This is one of our buoys that we collaborate on the NASA JPL laboratory with. We have four of them out on the lake and they're collecting real-time data, looking at surface temperature as well as temperature down the five meter water depth and they use the information collected from these buoys to calibrate the NASA satellites that take surface temperature measurements all over the world. The buoys use the solar panels to run on, so it's important to keep these clean so that all the instrumentation operates properly. As you can imagine, when these buoys are out on the water year-round, the wind, the snow, the weather really takes a toll on the instrumentation. So we check everything, make sure that the instrumentation's in good shape, all the connectors are working. A little dirty, but little dirty. everything's still here. We also have an atmospheric deposition bucket on top of the buoy. It's a little bit of water. And that collects different nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as fine sediment particles that are settling onto the surface of the lake from the atmosphere. One of the great things about Lake Tahoe is that it's clear. So when we use drones for aerial imagery, we can actually see through the water column. When we do nearshore monitoring, we create a flight path of the nearshore, and the drone will follow that predetermined grid, and it will take photos along the grid, and then those photos will get stitched together in one large image that we can use for nearshore data. The grid is the same every time. It makes it so we can do repeatable flights at each site and ensure that we're getting the same coverage when we return. The drone has a huge advantage because it allows us to see a much larger portion of the shoreline. So when we take samples with divers, it's a one point sample along the shoreline and the drone allows a much bigger area and a larger spatial coverage of data capture in the near shore. We're at Sand Harbor. We have a near shore station here that we need to do a calibration on. So we'll be suiting up with dive gear and jumping in the water. Our dive team here up at Turk has a lot of expertise in working here at Lake Tahoe. We're all scientific divers, we're all altitude divers. You get a lot more pressures on the body as you try to dive in a higher altitude environment. So it changes our dive planning a bit. We can't have bottom times nearly as long because we're building up gases in our body while we're diving. In winter time, the water temps are below 50 degrees, which constitutes diving in dry suits, which is a specialty in itself. It's rough when you can't feel your hands when you're getting out of the lake. Sometimes we have to ask our dive buddies to help us take our gear off because our fingers don't work. Being a team of divers together, relying on each other and being dependent on each other for your safety and to get the work done has created a really tight bond between the dive team up here. Oh, we find like cell phones, masks, Lures, pocket knives, all kinds of goodies where, you know, lake treasure. The near shore area of Lake Tahoe is really important because that is the part of the lake that the public interacts with the most. It's very few people who actually get out to the center of the lake, but almost every visitor that comes to the Tahoe Basin gets to that shoreline and sees the near shore area of Tahoe. So since that's where visitors get the most interaction with the lake, that's where we've been focusing a lot of our research lately. We have a network of real-time nearshore monitoring stations. They're in about six feet of water and they provide data on 
water temperature, pressure, chlorophyll, turbidity. It really gives us a great data resolution in those areas so we can see what's going on in those little micro environments around the lake and understand how it may be changing over time. To put in a nearshore station network like this, it took years of fundraising and both on the groundwork to wire everything up to the docks, get these stations built, and get them functioning well in the lake. Tahoe's beautiful, but it's not such a friendly place for electronics sometimes. It's cold, it's wavy, and we definitely struggled kind of getting everything going, but now we got all the bugs out, and it's super unique to have such a huge data set. In the springtime, Lake Tahoe has periphyton, which is attached algae, that grows on rocks and docks and other structures in the nearshore area. So if you come up in the spring, sometimes you'll see almost like this shag carpet look to the rocks. This is called a double syringe sampler, and this is how we actually collect an algae sample. There's a toothbrush at the end here, and so what we do is we put this on the rock and we spin it around. So we scrub the algae off, and then we can take the cork, sneak it back in there. And now we have the algae sample, which we take back to the lab. We can look at the different species, what kind of algal community we have in the near shore. And we can also look at things like production, so how much chlorophyll is produced in these samples. The drone work and the paraphyton monitoring are both part of the same program. So getting in the water to ground truth the drone flights is part of the bigger picture. It gives us a little bit of background on what's going on in the water while the drone flight gives us information and data on what's going on along the entire shoreline. Clam hunting. So today we're at Sand Harbor. And there's a population of Asian clams that popped up here in the last decade. We're gonna do some surveys to see what their population looks like and how it's changed from this summer to last. Invasive species have been a problem in Lake Tahoe for decades now. A lot of the metaphyton algae that we, we see in the near shore is associated with dense populations of Asian clams. Turk has done a couple different experiments to see if we could try to treat these populations before they got out of control. With Lake Tahoe, you don't want to use any chemical treatments. Ideally, you want to use benign, natural ways to get at invasive species. The work that we're doing here not only is it applied in the basin, but it's also taken to other lakes within the U.S. and across the world. These are adult clams. They get to a pretty decent size. And this sample is really interesting because you can see there's a lot of little ones. So there's a lot of recruitment, a lot of reproduction going on in this area of the lake. They don't belong here, that's the first thing. The lake's heating up, the clams are more active, they're excreting more nutrients, you're gonna get more of that metaphyton starting to come into the near shore area. And eventually, that could end up on beaches, which is definitely what we don't want. If we can tackle some of these problems that we have been seeing popping up over the years, then we can hopefully mitigate what's going on. We are the research that informs mitigation strategies around the lake. The so red means stop, green means go. Here at Turk, we use a lot of underwater robotics. This includes ROVs, which are remotely operated vehicles, and AUVs, which are autonomous underwater vehicles. So deploying a glider is actually pretty easy. We set up the glider in the lab, we ballast it here, and basically set it up to run. And then we put it in a car, drive it over to the lake, just a couple miles down the road, and toss it off the back of the boat. It's then autonomous, which means we don't have to actively pilot it. These autonomous underwater vehicles make use of buoyancy in order to float or sink in Lake Tahoe without having to use powered propellers. This is helpful because it allows us to measure very quiet environments like Lake Tahoe without disturbing the ambient water column. All right, starting dive sequence. We can collect information across the entire lake from shore to shore, north, south, east, and west, and from the very surface up to hundreds of meters of depth. It allows us to understand the mixing dynamics throughout the lake that we otherwise would not be able to understand with just single point measurements. We can deploy this on a single charge for up to a month at a time. So would you just leave it out here for a month? So we'll deploy it, we'll go back to the marina, and then this tail fin is actually a satellite antenna as well 
So using this, when it surfaces, we're able to communicate with it over a satellite connection, get data off of it, send it new commands on, to go on new missions, and to continue monitoring the lake. We try really hard to not lose the glider. We've had quite a few close calls before. We personally have never lost a glider, but there are stories of people losing these such instruments around the world. It's important to understand the physics of Lake Tahoe, to understand how changes in the lake affect the food web, affect water clarity, water quality, all of which have benefits both for humans and the environment. It's a great opportunity to develop emerging engineering techniques and use the lake as a laboratory. I think we're always learning new things here at Tahoe. The only constant is change up here. The lake surprises us, so it's really cool to see the lake teaching us throughout the years as well. We've also learned the power of the people. As people in the basin and even more broadly get involved and care about Tahoe, we really can make a big difference.